we're creating about as many jobs as those other metros combined. So Ben hates to be compared to Boulder. We could have a whole hour conversation about this. I think it sets us up another kind of foundation. Participating. Okay. I think that's the difference between being a citizen or sitting on the sidelines. These conversations are brought to you by the Lad Group, Ben's leading real estate team. Help continue this Ben B conversation by subscribing, sharing, and leaving us a review. Thank you for coming today. Um, Pleasure. Uh, here we have uh, Mike Holleran, who is an absolute force in, in the history of Bend and, and especially in the development side of it. And every time we've done these podcasts, I end it with, who would you like to see be the next person interviewed? And I would say most of them um, uh, have mentioned your name. So I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me today. So what happens when you have seniority? You've been around a long time. <laughs> Just by age, okay. So so speaking of that, um, you have been a large influence in the region for over 50 years, um, joining Brooks Resources. Uh, when, did, when did you join Brooks Resources? Well, I came here from, uh, we were living in Palo Alto. I came here in 1965. Okay. And came to work for Brooks Scanlon. Brooks Scanlon. Brooks, Excuse Brooks me. Resources didn't exist at the time. Yep. And we started Brooks Resources in 1969. Okay. When we realized that we, as a timber company, we own 200,000 plus acres of land. And some of that had a higher and better use than growing trees on a 200 year cycle. Yep. So we started Brooks Resources as a wholly owned subsidiary then and spun it off later before we sold the timber company to Diamond International. Okay. And so, you know, some of your more uh, noteworthy communities that people are familiar with Black Butte Ranch, North Rim. Aubrey Butte and Northwest Crossing. Um, is there any particular development that you have, you know, the most pride that you, that you helped develop in Bend or, you know, were they each kind of their own, their own animal? Well, they, were, they, were, they were each different. I mean, Mott Bachelor Village was, was fun. Shevlin Center was an interesting one because we created a local improvement district to build a bridge in the road going through the project. Probably Northwest Crossing, the joint venture with Mike Tennant and his family is a, uh, the most gratifying one because it's been very well received and the whole idea of new urban communities and uh, alleys, alley fed streets and mixed use areas and reducing single occupant vehicle travel and all that has really been uh, successful and it's been fun to be part of. Yeah, it's, um, did you ever imagine in Northwest Crossing at in, in, to the current stage it is with prices and desirability and you know the amount of attention it's got around the nation as far as a, a successful what is a successful development well I, it, we uh we're always optimists i mean you have to be if you're in the development business you yeah. always think things are going to turn out well and it basically it's turned out pretty much the way we initially planned it uh with the exception of pricing yeah. uh, when we started we felt our market were largely sort of two income young professionals with a couple of kids and they could afford their first house yeah. on a relatively small lot. Yeah. Maybe they could get by with one car, uh, but we weren't anticipating that the average price of those homes are gonna go up to the million dollar range, which is essentially price that segment of the market out, which is a tough thing, which we're all dealing with in this, the whole housing affordability issue. So yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, when I moved to Bend, so you've seen the full, the full spectrum but when i moved to bend the median price was 230,000 and last month we are at 775 for the median price in, ha in in bend obviously that's the elephant in the room that will bottleneck everything from business growth on, on through um, you know the, the, there's no easy answer on that but but we have to tackle that how, how does bend get its hands around the housing price issue well, it, it's it's complex. I mean, the demand is there. It's 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 the pricing is is driven by demand and a lack of supply. Yeah. And the lack of supply, you can argue it in lo lots of different directions. Uh, maybe our land use laws. Maybe we're not building up enough. Maybe we're not dense enough. Yeah. Uh, the pandemic has left a lot of people moving out of the construction business. Yeah. Uh, employees are hard to find. Supply chain issues are difficult. Yeah. Uh, people who are living in San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, many of them want to move here. So they keep coming and they keep driving prices up. It's not an easy, we've got to increase the supply is what it amounts to and how we do that with other smaller units, uh, building up instead of out. Uh, Oregon land use laws have really done a good job of protecting a lot of things, but they've created some supply constraints as well. Yeah, so the Oregon land use laws, and, and we 
can't go too deep into that right now. It's it's a whole podcast on its own, but a very complex set of land use laws and a lot of criteria that cities have to meet to to do expansions of their urban growth boundary. Um, holistically, how do you feel about those and, and the way they've retained, you know, because the intent, right, is to keep urban, urban and rural, rural in Oregon, right? To create denser communities um, surrounded by, you know, rural, um, low density development. And it's by and large succeeded with that. But um, one of the byproducts is, you know, not being able to respond to supply quickly enough. Are you, how do you holistically feel about those land use laws and how it's played out in Oregon since the 70s? <laughs> um, it's just, holistically, uh, we've actually always been supporters of Oregon land use laws, which are a little bit unusual for most developers. Um, it takes a lot longer. There's a lot more paperwork. There's a lot of issues and difficult things to go through. But I mean, the example that I've always used, uh, if we had not had Senate Bill 100 and the land use laws in this state. Think of what Central Oregon would look like now, particularly the roads between, say, Sisters and Bend, yeah. Redmond and Bend, Sisters and Redmond. It would be nothing but uh, travel trailers and RV parks and uh, and spread out malls. So it's it's done its job yeah. in preserving urban growth boundaries. It's done a good job of pre preserving coasts and estuaries and rivers and forests and farmland to a large degree. It has also created all kinds of problems and it's added costs. You know, it takes a long time to get things approved based on Oregon's land use laws and the way the cities interpret them. Yep, absolutely. And it's 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 interesting to hear that you're that supportive of it because I am as well. But I think kind of the general perception would be that developers are automatically against that because they want to put on supply as quickly as they want. But when when you look at neighboring states, whether that be Idaho or California or whatnot, you can see the results of cities and counties without those, and it's the result's very different. But you can. On the other hand, you look at Texas, incredible economy, growing very strong, no income taxes, virtually no land use laws, yep. and uh, the economies are great, and there are people who love that yep. environment. I'm just happy we live in Oregon and we have the laws and constraints that we have. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's definitely a quality of life issue, but you know, let's let's talk about that. So it's not easy to be a developer in Oregon as opposed to those states. Why Bend? You know, tell me your origin story and, and why you came here. You know, <laughs> what brought you to Bend? Well, a, a job. Just a job. OK. Uh, I mean, it was, it was yeah, coming to work for Brooks Scanlon, the, the timber company. My family had had an interest in the business and I was really didn't have the self-confidence to go to work for a company that family had an investment interest in. but. Uh, after working for Stanford University for a couple of years, I uh, was offered a job here and we came. And I went home and told Sue that uh, I had this job offer. And what do you think? He said, Bend, Oregon? And yeah. It's 10,000 people or 11,000 maybe at the time. And we made, a, we made an agreement that we would give it two years. At the end of two years, if either one of us wanted to leave, okay, we'd leave. Because this, this is a small town. This is a very different environment from what we have now. Yeah. And the, the odd thing is that that question never came up again. <laughs> if you're fortunate enough to be able to live in Bend and raise kids, and we had three kids at the time when we came here, uh, if you can, you're, if you're able to live here, put your kids in school here and travel to other places where unlike what city people do of coming to Bend, it's, it's really been a great place. So yeah, great place to live. And so let's talk about that. So Bend has changed a lot. When you moved here and it was 10,000 people, um, and now we've just crested 100,000. So, so you see the tenfold increase. How do you feel about what's happened? Because um, obviously most people are incredibly fond of Bend. It's one of the most desirable places to move, but having witnessed and participated in that growth, um, how do you feel the net result of, of that 10X growth was? Uh, well, there are certainly, there are, there are some negatives, but, but on balance, I think it's all been very positive. Yeah. And if you think about what Bend was like then and think about the number of restaurants or movie theaters or the cultural activities or uh, things that people now really rely on and come to um, enjoy Bend. I mean, I, I think it's, for the most part, it's been great. Yep. Uh, not always have we dealt with the traffic problems perfectly. Yep. Uh, but I, it's a, I, I think it's been a thoughtful approach to handling growth. Yeah, I, I think the net result is, is quite positive. And if you go to most other communities that have seen this type of growth, it's 
you know, grid traffic patterns with stoplights and traffic in all directions with no trail connectivity and, you know, incomplete communities where people have to get in their car for absolutely every piece of their life. And mm -hmm. it's a it's an incredible result. Um, and what I've often found is that the people that have been here the longest are the most appreciative of the change. Mm -hmm. And some of the, the newer citizens of Bend are the most reluctant to see change. Sometimes it's the, the so-called moat complex. Like, I'm here now, let's pull up the drawbridge and not have any more people come in. But I, th I think the growth is going to continue. Yep. And I, we just need to deal with it effectively. And the people who come here, hopefully, well, they will continue to be involved and make yeah. this community better in the future. Okay, so you, you talked about going up and not out. Obviously, a lot of that's gonna be based around the Central Redevelopment District. Let's talk about that a little bit more because that is gonna be a character change for the town. I think it's gonna create different housing types and I think it's incredibly important for the town. Um, but let's talk about that. Is Bend, is Bend ready for about what's about to happen in that redevelopment district? And, and how long do you think it'll take to really become visual and start playing out? Well, I think Bend is ready. And one of the reasons that they picked the Central Business District as a place to allow for much more density, yep. higher density and taller buildings, is that there are very few people who live there. Yes. So you're not going to have the NIMBY problem of that. That's fine to have a tall apartment building, but not next to me. Yeah. So, so there, that, that removes a lot of the, uh, the obstacles. We bought a piece of property, the old Murray and Holt, lot uh, on Franklin we're planning to build an apartment building there which we put we put on pause right now because the city <laughs> it's this conflict of homelessness and how, how are we dealing with these things but they they bought the Rainbow Motel which is scheduled to be a low barrier homeless shelter yep well if, are we going to really build a 140 unit apartment project across the street from that when that might have a negative impact so we're we're pausing that project for the time being Long term, I think the Central Business District is going to be very successful. And I think people will accept it, yeah. uh, but some short term issues. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the builders and developers in this area generally are trained to do single family zoning, 10,000 square foot lots, you know, in the scale of doing, you know, standard stick frame construction. Do we have the, the, the talent pool and resources to, to go vertical like that? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, there, there are a number of companies. I mean, Cohen Skoberg has done some high-rise stuff with podium pedestal sorts of buildings. Uh, yep. We're building a CLT office building across laminated timber on, on Shevlin Park Road. Um, hiatus homes and what Jesse's doing. Yeah. I mean, there are people who are doing smaller size things. Yeah. The, uh, the small condominium kind of project here at the Grove at Northwest Crossing. Mm -hmm. Those are small units. That's a very, very different product. Yep. And yeah, I, th I think we have a lot of builders who are very talented, either building Muse products or townhome products or attached units. So I, I'm not worried about that skill level of the builders themselves, the basic workers who are going to be working for those people and the subcontractor availability is, is very much an issue. That's, that's tough. Brian Ladd here. I hope you're enjoying the conversation and find this dialogue relevant to really what it means to live and work and play in this amazing community. As Ben's leading real estate team, we take our role seriously in representing both buyers and sellers at the absolute highest standards of our industry. For more information on how we can help, feel free to visit our website at benpropertysource.com or text LAD1, L-A-D-D-1 to 88000. Well, and I've talked about this before and I don't want to be too repetitive, but you brought up the moat complex of people saying, hey, I'm in, it's time to put up, to pull up the drawbridge and I've got my moat and Ben shouldn't change. You know, if you were to sit down and have a coffee or a beer with them and you had a conversation, what, what would that conversation look like? How would you help them understand that, you know, change is necessary for Ben? Well, it wouldn't be a matter, of, I wouldn't tell them so much it's necessary that it's going to happen. It's just, it's inevitable. I mean, well, I think so. I mean, yeah. there are enough, I mean, 85% of our county is owned by the federal government. We have the natural features here and the resources and the weather and the recreation, uh, reasonable transportation systems. And now we've got a strong education base, a great medical community. People are going to keep coming here yeah. and the economy is diversifying. So you, I mean, you can be an ostrich and hide your head in the sand and just and bitch about it, but that's not, uh, that's not the answer. Let, let's, let's try and find the right kinds of solutions, which I tend to feel are in the area of greater density of taking those actions, which are, will help 
climate, uh, which reduce single occupant and vehicle miles traveled. Uh, are we gonna have to put up a little more congestion? Yeah, probably. Uh, is that all bad? No, I mean, it takes a few more minutes to get to work maybe, but it's, it's not the end of the world and you've got all of these other assets and attributes yeah. that come along with it. Well, it's pretty progressive ideas for little old Bend, Oregon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it's, it's exciting to see what's being done here. Um, and frankly, I hope there's a lot of other small metro areas around that are paying attention to what you're doing here. Um, so I grew up a son of a home builder and a land developer. And I remember the day in a neighborhood that my father had probably built, someone having a bumper sticker on their car saying, save an elk, hit a land developer. <laughs> And so, you know, even from a young age, I had to understand the kind of the dual, you know, the, the two sides of, of providing housing. And often even the people that are buying the housing from you are antagonistic or unappreciative of new development. And obviously, you know, we're not a, even, you know, I, I'm not immune to it. And I, I find myself begrudging some of the change and growth, even in just my 15 years here. But um, how do you how do you, how do you resolve that in your mind, having built some of the most well accepted, most desirable neighborhoods in Bend, um, but yet we're we're getting you know a lot of people that are anti growth, anti change. You know, how how do you resolve that in your your head? Well, I'm not I'm not sure you can fully resolve it. I mean, some people are just not going to like change. Yeah. They're, they're, that's human nature to they like things to stay the same. Yeah. But the things that we have done have been really working on the mixed use neighborhoods, for example, on the, the alleys behind on the more uh, stronger neighborhood kinds of things. We have always tried to save as many trees as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, we, we, we've done a lot of things that are, are a little bit different from what we used to think of the California developer who just kelp all the trees and yeah. then build houses there and little lots and then plant some trees around it after, after, after the fact. And we, we just approached it differently, starting with Black Butte Ranch, where we, uh, yeah. we, we we had all this timberland that was near, which is largely where the homes are at Black Butte Ranch. Uh, and it was owned by Brooks Scanlon. We put it into the property that had been the original ranch. And uh, we had great debates about how many trees to cut down. And we took down about a third of them. And that's if you drive around there are 1,250 homes at Black Butte Ranch. And if you drive around there, a third of those trees were gone. And those were old growth, 150 to 300 year old ponderosa pine trees. In retrospect, we should have taken out two thirds of them because now you've got great difficulties with too many trees that are too close. And it'd be very hard to take them out now, but they're in both fire danger and old trees die eventually and they fall on houses. So we, we've tried to be sensitive to that. Yeah. All the time we've been developing and we've been learning. Same thing with Aubrey Butte. Yeah. When we had, we bought 1,800 acres of Aubrey Butte in 1970, sold the first home, I believe, in 1986. Okay. So we have a long time horizon. But uh, we designed those roads in a way that they're, you can't see them from most parts of town because yeah. they're, they're in the, it's, it's all contoured around in a, in a way that uh, it isn't just the developer approach to tearing everything down and build it up again and build as much density as you can. Be sensitive to the land, which we've tried to do. Let's talk about whole communities. That seems to be a trend of development um, nationwide, but I have seen executed quite well here in Bend in several different areas. If you could just help us understand what is a whole community and how is it different from a standard development or a standard planned urban development? Well, I, would, I guess I would approach it from two levels. If you think of our Northwest Crossing project with some 12, 14, 13, 1400 units yep. and Discovery West next to it, <clears throat> we'll have another 675. That's a, in a way, that's kind of a whole community. We have a commercial area, we have many employment centers, uh, several schools. So, so that's all, they're all there. I mean, in theory, that community, people can pretty much stay there and do whatever they need to do in terms of restaurant, school, housing, employment, you can get by maybe with one car instead of two, all that sort of thing in a broader sense. And then the thing that worries me about Bend is, is the whole community of the whole city. Yep. And, and I don't like, for example, the perceived east-west divide. Yep. I don't think that's a positive thing going forward. And partly it's railroad tracks, partly it's uh, 
just the way things have been played out. Partly it's because the, the land that was easiest to develop and therefore make the lower cost housing has been on the east side of Bend instead of the west side. But, but I don't like that perceived difference between the two sides. And I think we ought to do everything we can. The city is in improving the east-west connectivity. Yep. And uh, are they not, a uh, uh, pedestrian bridge is now in planning process for Hawthorne? In the plan, yeah. Okay. It, it'll, be, it'll be fun to see how that, how that plays out. Pedestrian bridges over major highways frequently don't produce, they aren't used as yep. much as people. I, I, I served as the chairman of our state transportation commission for several years. Okay. And uh, wow. dealt with a lot of that kind of stuff. Let's talk about, I think one of the most interesting things with your development that we're sitting in here now, Northwest Crossing, Discovery West, is this concept of Guild of Builders. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of ramifications on that from a lot of builders being able to build successful businesses and employees and, and whatnot off of that. Um, what was the vision on that as opposed to a master builder program in, in these developments? Well, I know it was driven, we, we felt the same way. Uh, Mike Tennant had some very strong feelings about it. He'd done some sort of old neighborhood kinds of developments before, and we formed this joint venture to buy the Miller property where both of these projects are located. And we spent a long time planning it and thinking about it. And really, it's very intentional. Uh, we, we specifically, I mean, the other approach would be to take a big chunk of land and say, okay, we're gonna sell a hundred lots, for example, to one builder and then D.R. Horton comes and builds something and Polish builds something. Well, that's not, that was not our vision. We wanted it to look like, you know, fit into the old Bend neighborhood that's part of where Northwest Crossing grows into or they grew into here. Uh, and <clears throat> so we had the idea that we would have a series of, a bunch of builders and it's ranged from 15 to 25 over the years uh, in whom we had great confidence who'd been here for a long time and who understood our architecture review requirements and were willing to work with all the stuff that we're trying to do and keep their sites clean, for example. And then we would have, uh, we would use them and we, we would price the lots and we'd have a lottery yeah. and we still do that. And we, we price them at an MLS price, but our builders have the right to buy them at 10% off that price. And then there's a, they, we, they don't bid it up, yeah. but they, they pick the lots, so they scatter around different styles, different approaches. And it, it's created, uh, I, I think, a community with, with enough enough difference that it doesn't look like a tract home development. And that's exactly what we wanted uh, to have happen. Yeah. Plus, it's what, what's been interesting is to see the two or three dozen or so Guild of Builders use Northwest Crossing as a launch pad to, to gr grow their businesses yeah. because they had that as a de facto partnership with you and a reliable source of business that they were able to build. And when you look at the ramifications of that on this town, it's, I mean, every builder at any one time is hiring 30 subs and those 30 subs all have 10 employees. I mean, the multi, you know, the multiplier effect of, of those small builder and builders on the employment of this town is, is pretty massive. Yes, it is. I agree. Um, so that's that's been really exciting to watch. So we've talked a lot about the industry and building, um, but it, the more research I did on you, a lot of it came back to just making you and your organization synonymous with community support and involvement. Um, was this just over time it naturally developed, or is this a, a core value that you know you built your company around about being? integral to to creating a whole community well I, it was it, it's been integral to in brooks scanlon and shevlin hickson which shut down the two mills that the primary employers yeah. <coughs> in bend until shevlin hickson closed in 1950 and brooks scanlon bought their timberland and continued on uh, it was a core value of both of those companies in a very small town at the time that you had to con contribute to the community yeah. you really had to get back I and mean, they gave the land for example for shevlin park and for the bend golf club um, really? And, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and, and some land that filled the gap in, in Drake Park in downtown Bend. Uh, we've had mayors, people who've served on virtually every elected body, been involved in all kinds of things that have happened in town. And we just, we've always, that, that's been an ingrained value when I came here. And we certainly uh, want to continue that. Yeah. So you were behind the creation of the Bend Foundation, correct? No, the Bent Foundation was created before my time. Okay. It was actually at a time it was created because uh, when unions weren't very strong and companies didn't have things like long-term disability plans, 
or even very effective pension plans. And because we were in a business, or a company was, of logging and sawmill operations, uh, that there tend to be a fair number of accidents. So when people at age 50 got disabled or lost a leg or something, there was no financial mechanism to take care of them. Okay. And the foundation was really formed to provide an opportunity but by the shareholders and by the company to provide opportunity to give some money to people on a kind of like a pension or a long-term disability plan now. Oh, really? That, okay. That all went away as, as unions and other plans got developed. Yeah. So the Ben Foundation really uh, has been, a, it's both the both companies, Brooks Scandal and Brooks Resources have supported it uh, as the primary contributors to the foundation. But uh, it, it's been around for a long time and it's morphed and it's, it's uh, the kinds of things that it wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, when I came to town, we looked and we kind of made an assessment on behalf of the Ben Foundation or the company and felt <clears throat> that the greatest needs in Bend, this little rural logging town, were really cultural enrichment. I mean, whether we, we didn't see poverty or the social safety net kinds of things, or, or they just weren't there. But I mean, typically the people who lived in Bend, the man went to work in the mill, the wife stayed home with the kids, everybody lived happily ever after, and it was all fine. But so we were looking at cultural enrichment, whether it was art, music, museums, that sort of thing. Over time, that's morphed a lot. I mean, and the social safety net stuff is a, obviously we've all seen it in both the homeless problems and hunger and other issues. So we've been doing more things there. You know, I think the homelessness um, and the social safety net is probably, or the lack thereof, is probably one of the most visual um, negative outcomes of what we're seeing right now. And, and it's not Ben's fault. It's up and down the West Coast. It's across mm -hmm. the U.S. Um, but that's, how do we deal with that? You know, where do, you know, I know there's a lot of good organizations jumping on that one, um, but is this something that Ben's going to get after? I mean, you know, does, does Ben have the courage to address it the way that, you know, Ben normally does with, with positivity and optimism? I, I think so. I mean, I, I mean, the jury's out because nobody's really solved this problem. Those cities that are afflicted with the tent camps and all that, but it, 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 it has to be a multi-pronged approach. I mean, part of it are, are PTSD vets, part of it are people who've been lost their homes because of money. Yeah. A lot of issues, drugs, mental health, and, and there has to be a package answer to that. But basically it's, the long-term answer is providing more housing. It just simply has to be provided in some form, yeah. whether it's affordable with a capital A, meaning subsidized or, or a, some other form. But along with that, there have to be a lot of services. And I think the city of Bend is really doing a pretty, a pretty darn good job of thinking about it and yeah. creating things that, that, that will help. It's going to take some time. It's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. You know, part of the, the impetus for having these discussions in this podcast was to share all the creative and hardworking people like yourself that made Ben what it is. Um, and there was a lot of optimism. And, and I just and, and that's something that I hope we don't lose as we change, you know, when from a 10,000 person to a 100,000 person town, I guess what I fear a little bit is that people don't necessarily feel their role in a town of 100 or 150,000 people. They don't know how they can possibly make a difference. Sure. And, you know, I guess what I'm trying to help define is what does it mean to be a Bend citizen? Well, I, I would hope there'd be citizens who really truly want to get involved, that want to be part of the community and want to make it a better community and, and deal with the change in the future. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a. An example is at the time when we were just beginning to think about Northwest Crossing, we just bought the property. The city of Bend was growing fast at the time, not as fast as it has since then. <clears throat> but they had a traffic problem on the west side of Bend. And essentially, it wasn't a matter of capacity on the roads, it was a matter of the intersections. And we, uh, working with the city, we formed a public-private partnership and created what was then called the West Side Consortium. Yeah. We had just built the first Weebrooks Resources roundabout on what was then Century Drive in Colorado and 14th. The first of many. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and we, we, we and the city said, you know, let, let, let's do roundabouts to solve these congestion problems at intersections. And the city bought into that. And I think that I think the public, after originally some skepticism, sure. um, it, 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 if you're going to have a road system you're better off having a lot of roundabouts and, and not, have, not, not have a traffic light go into a roundabout and then into another traffic light because the, the platoon system doesn't work. 
So we, we still, we do not have a traffic light west of the Deschutes River in the city of Bend. There are all, all these intersections have been dealt with with roundabouts. And in general, it's not, it's not perfect, but they are safer. They're better for the environment and climate. They're somewhat more attractive. Uh, so I, we're, we're happy to have participated in helping create that group of developers and put that together. And we did it, the city went along with it. Uh, they agreed that uh, we could use systems development charges so, so that really what we were doing as developers were building those roundabouts in advance. Yeah. So we were making an interest-free loan to the city of Bend and taking all the risks that would ultimately be systems development charges collected to pay us back for the, uh, the infrastructure okay. improvements that we made. And uh, I think the net result is, is amazing. You're, you're usually moving in the town, you're, the flow works well, and, and you're not idling behind cars at a stop plane. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's it's that sort of collaborative, you know, you know, that those collaborative efforts that have made Bend what it is today. And uh, I'm glad you're able to share this with everybody because, you know, I just want to share the history of, of all the optimistic, you know, explorers that helped create Bend what it is. And, uh, you know, the, we're not sure what the next Bend is going to look like. Um, but I guess you tell me, what has been to you in another 20, 30 years? What does it look like and, and, and how is it going to be different from the way it is today? Well, hopefully it'll be more of the same, but there are going to be a lot of new people that are going to be making some wonderful decisions about where really, transportation systems are really kind of critical to, yep. uh, I mean, whether it's, it's the, uh, what we did with the road across the, the Billy Lee Bridge. Uh, when I was on the Transportation Commission and the, and the traffic was beginning to build up in Bend, the real the debate was, and more and more people more people thought that the freeway or parkway should go around Bend, somewhere out by the Bend Airport. Okay. Uh, those of us who were, my in my view, more thoughtful about it, they, that's really a bad decision. I mean, that would that would create sort of little retail places out around the city, and Bend would lose the core, and all those people would go there. So that I think the present location is exactly the right space. How do we, how do we keep this 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 energy alive? You know? Well, I, I think we rely on the people who are who are, have moved here or who grew up here, and then and, and they, if they care about the legacy, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll it'll it'll be different in the future. But I, th I think having a lot of caring people. You know, if you look over the years at the uh, in, in general, the city councils have been really well intentioned, good people. The, the staff, the people who run things. Yeah. Are, are strong people. I've never heard of any sort of problem with fraud or graft anywhere in Bend. Hmm. Just, and, and a lot of cities are just rampant with that. Uh, so I, I think people need to be sensitive to that and think about when they're voting for city councilors or school board members or park board members, what kind of people do you want to have running this place? And that's, that, that's a responsibility for all of us to vote and think about it. But then to, to roll up your sleeves and get involved in something that you feel you can make a difference about and then hopefully we'll continue to do that. It's been fun to, to talk to all the different people that have had very different versions of what Bend is, but they have all come together to <laughs> create it what it is from the trail systems to the, the neighborhoods like we're sitting in right now. So, well, thank you yeah. for your time today. Bet, Brian, it's a pleasure. It was much appreciated and uh, I look forward to sharing this with our listeners. Good. Take Thanks. care. Thanks a lot.